today's guest is Bruce Hughes. He is a stroke survivor. He has had to face something we will all have to face one day. But here he is to tell his story with humor, passion, insight, and something you can't just describe somehow. There's a spark in him that is spectacular. Hope you enjoy the conversation. So thanks for coming. Glad to be here. It's been a long time. Yeah, glad to be here in, in many respects. Huh? Yes, many respects <laughs> is right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in my intro, I will have mentioned you know what you've been through in the past mm -hmm. year. Um, but to hear it from you, a short version, and then we'll d dive into some key bits. Okay. So maybe just bring our audience up to speed about what Mr. Hughes has been through this past year. Okay. Uh, eight months ago, May 31st, woke up feeling not very well. I had been home. My wife had broke her back in a car accident the uh, previous November. I'd been home taking care of her, and I, I said, I'm not feeling that well. You haven't driven in about six months. You should you go see if you can drive because I'm not sure I can get you to your doctor's appointment. Uh, the next day and about an hour later I went to get up and just boom uh, my arm you know the signs uh, I was pretty sure I was having a stroke and uh, she called 911 911 came by the time they got to our house um, I was sitting up feeling fine talking well nothing bothered me they did all my vitals checked me all out couldn't find a single thing wrong with me, said I was incredibly normal, you know, my vitals. So I said, well, you know, I'd like to grab a shower and then I'll go to the emergency room. Uh, my wife took the dog. She was going to go for a walk and uh, they didn't get five minutes out and the dog turned and drug her home. And I was upstairs in the bathroom and the big stroke hit. And I was laying there on my last breath, thought I was going to die and heard the back door open. And I just got enough breath to call her name, and she called the uh, second ambulance. And they came and transported me to Fredericton. Uh, that was, I think I get in there about 11, 11.30 in the morning to emergency. And for the next three, four hours, it was just chaos to me. Um, and then Dr. Boma came on the scene in the afternoon, and she took one good look at me, and she figured what was happening, grabbed my wife and uh, said, I think I know what's wrong, and it's a really serious stroke, and if we don't try this new procedure, um, it's going to be catastrophic right here. So with that, they intubated me and sent me to St. John, and that's all I remember till they brought me out of it the next day, and uh, the next morning in St. John General Hospital, or Regional Hospital, I guess it is, yeah. um, they had performed this procedure on me, and what they didn't tell me was, you know, they told me it was risky, but they didn't really kind of, you know, say how risky. Um, and then when I found out later that, you know, the 3% or so that had lived previously was trying this in the test trials, uh, most of them, if not all of them, were paralyzed from the eyes down. So I had done some work in the past with brain injured patients and uh, and a family member that had a stroke up at the Stan Cassidy. So I, I had some knowledge and knew about neuroplasticity and stuff. So when I woke up, nothing uh, worked at all. I was totally paralyzed from the, like, the neck down. And within a couple hours, my left side come back pretty strong. And then my right side uh, had nothing. So I knew that there you had to, it's literally mind over matter. So I thought, I have to lay here for four hours to get this giant tube taken out of my throat. So I'll just lay there, and I stared at my right elbow for you know quite a considerable amount of time. And then it finally moved a little bit. And my brother noticed it, and uh, he was quite excited. And I said, um, in my mind, because I can't talk yet or anything, uh, I thought I've got to look at look at this again because it might have been muscle reflex or something. And it only took about 15 seconds the second time. So I knew I had made this connection with my brain to my right side. And I thought, I'm going to do everything I can because I know time is the enemy here. So I just laid there. And by the next morning, I could wiggle a little bit, a few fingers and toes. And the doctors were freaking out because they had never seen anyone come back like that. So and i've been recovering ever since <laughs> you know yeah and and your laughter is wonderful well 
I, I learned in the hospital um, when I first got into rehab, well, well, just in general, like hmm. if you don't find something to focus on, you can go dark pretty quick. Yeah. Your story of um, focusing on your elbow mm -hmm. and trying to get it to move reminds me of uh, Deepak Chopra, who came to Moncton 10, 12 years ago, did yeah. a little lecture. I was to promote his book, um, Reinventing the Body, Resurrecting the Soul. <laughs> yeah, very fitting. Yeah. <laughs> and he tells a story of um, a neuroscientist in Montreal at McGill, actually. And he's acting it out on the stage, almost like Richard Pryor would act out all the different characters in yeah. the stage. And uh, so the patient's on the table, the doctor's saying, I'm going to stimulate this part of your brain and I'm going to raise your arm. Right. So, and the arm comes up. Okay, now I'm going to stimulate this part of your brain. I want you to keep your arm down. And over, you know, 15, 20 seconds, the arm wants to come up and you could tell the patient was, psh, no, kept the arm down. So neuroscience will explain it in mechanical terms. What Chopra was interested in was the power of the will. Yes. Like, where did that come from in the first place to create the new synaptic connections? And you just did it. Yeah, well, I, just because I had that knowledge of uh, from the past and working with patients, and now I was one, right? So I, I knew I had to do something, and uh, I thought I've got to start retraining my brain right now, you know? And the first six months is very crucial. That's when you get your big improvements. Hmm. And I was every day, like I was seeing the improvements, not just the, the physiotherapists and nurses and doctors I was working with, but I could see them. And that motivated me even more to try harder. And, you know, we, we met, uh, we were athletes in our day, you know, and so uh, the physiotherapists and stuff knew that and, and they knew I could be worked hard and wanted to be worked hard. So. Yeah. It really helped, but but having that, you're right, that mental uh, mind over matter, that willpower to say, you know, damn it, I'm going to get better, hmm. you know. And when all odds are against you, like um, my doctors, even my uh, Dr. Bauma, my uh, neurologist, uh, it wasn't until I saw a later interview with her <clears throat> that even she, when I left for St. John in the ambulance, fully expected me to die or be, you know, physically debilitated for the rest of my life so mm. when i come back a few days later to the hospital she's uh she was there before i got there and the nurses even said to me uh we've never had anybody on the floor before the patient got here we knew you were a big deal yeah. right and of course i didn't i hadn't been in a hospital since i was two so yeah. <laughs> this was all new to me i'm just yeah. you know what's going on here and uh when the when I got transferred back to Fredericton, it was at my request because m my wife with her broken back and my mom were traveling from Fredericton to St. John for the first few days to see me. And I'm like, she can't do that. She can barely walk, you know? And so I said, I'll take whatever beds available. And uh, so I, I was in St. John. I woke up in St. John. Yeah, it happened Tuesday, I think, or no, Wednesday morning. And then I woke up Thursday morning in St. John, and then they had found me a bed by Friday. So when we got to Fredericton, they wheeled me into a, a room, a ward, they call it, uh, with four of us. And there was three guys in there, 192, 195, 198. So in my mind, you know, they've given me very little chance. I'm in the goner room, so to speak. And uh, I just laid there for the first... I don't know how many days it was before I could walk or move or like I couldn't even go to the bathroom alone. It was just such a scary experience to be totally dependent on everyone else. But I refused. Uh, still to this day, I never pushed the buzzer for help. Mm -hmm. I would wait, you know, if someone happened to be there or, and I was just like, just give me a pee pass, I called it. Just let me go to the bathroom on my own and I'll start from there. Mm -hmm. And eventually they did and you know, I could take myself into the bathroom and that was freedom. You know, the first time I got up in a walker, that was freedom. You know, if it gets as, as this is as good as it gets, you know, okay, but it's better than yesterday. So hmm. it, uh, it's been quite a ride and, and I don't know if I'll write a book on it someday. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if I could re go over it again, but, uh, yeah. E I, even now talking about it like this is okay. Oh yeah, I, oh, okay. I'm I'm fine. I'm uh, I've spoken a lot about it. I've done quite yeah. a few interviews. Um, 
I've also, uh, I'm on two committees now with the hospital as a patient experience <laughs> advisor, helping them out. And uh, I'm going to see maybe, you know, if I get better in the next six months to a year about maybe turning it into a job, you know, mm. like, and do this for the rest of my life, help other people. Because uh, <coughs> the announcement that came out on Friday is just huge. Like it's, a, you know, as Dr. Black here said, it's a game changer and, uh, and I'm living proof that this new procedure can be done. You can survive at the, you know, I was out of the hospital in 51 days. You know, there's some people that don't even get on their feet for like five, six months, you know. Um, I got my first weekend pass in nine days, you know. <laughs> so I had a lot of things going for me. I mean, besides a great team that I had behind me, um, I guess my age, you know, I was 58 at the time, and that's pretty young to have a stroke, apparently. Um, but that that works to your advantage because you you know you have that willpower and drive and you know physical capacity to to give it a good effort, I guess. But it's been pretty wild. I will say that your internal conversations must be pretty good. Um, I I'm not. I'm a doubter. Like, it doesn't come out of me. People think I'm so confident stuff. Internally, you know, whether it's music uh, teaching when I used to do that or public speaking, whatever, I still get the butterflies. I just I just wing it, I say, you know, and whatever comes out in that humor again, right? You use that humor to overcome that nervousness. <clears throat> but in those moments when you're starting to question, is this it? Yeah. That's, that's profound, and here you are able to talk about it. Well... I'm I'm really happy to be able to talk about it. Like, <laughs> as they say, um, it's nice to be seen because it could have been a lot worse. And uh, when they grabbed my wife and there's 10 or 12, or it seemed like 10 or 12, there just was constantly people around me at my bed in the emergency room trying to figure out what went wrong. Uh, I knew I was stroking, but they couldn't figure out where or why because one side would drop out and then I'd sit up and talk normal. Uh, then one side, the other side would drop out, and it was my pupils. Um, Dr. Bauma, when she was doing her residency at McGill, she said she'd only seen one stroke like this in her life, and it was because my pupils were so small and staying that way, and I think they still are that way, and they may stay that way forever. She said that's how I knew it was uh, what's called a basilar arterial dissection, which means I tore my one of my brainstem arteries. Um, and then the blood started flowing in between the two walls and created, a, it was peeling it like wallpaper and created a flap. And that's why we would close that off and then clots would form and then a big one would force its way through and then it close again. And people say, well, you got two of them, right? Well, that's something else I discovered and it's a fairly high percentage for people and you don't know it until you've had an MRI CAT scan or a stroke or something. Um, of the two brain stems, and it's usually the right, but the left does um, doesn't quite develop properly. So it's it's not you know it's there, but it's not really working. And that's what happened with me. Once I tore the left one and created that problem, I didn't have the backup. So my case is the only one where the type of stroke you have, um, where the timeline goes out the window. And she just just explained this to me the other day because she said that there is no other option we try this even if it kills you but you're going to die anyway so no one was more surprised than me to wake up the next day and then to be paralyzed it's like yay i'm awake and then it's oh <laughs> you know this is another whole set of problems so uh once i could wiggle a few things i went i've made that connection there's hope hmm. and i'm just never going to stop so once they got me into a walker uh, there was a lady, she was a f private physiotherapist that had heard about my case and they were like, no, no, nobody's come back from this type of thing. And so she came in to see me on the weekend. Even the nurses were kind of like, what's she doing here? You know, <laughs> oh, the new guinea pig. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, she came in and, and put me in a walker and it was just so nice to get up out of bed. Like I, it was just days and I was, you know, like bed sores and, you know, you're aching so bad and just to get up and spread those hips, I was like, oh God. So we went out in the hall and she had me do a little walk and 
we went maybe 50 feet and she goes oh, okay well we better go back and i said no <laughs> <laughs> so i just kept i said i'm going to the end of this hallway and back i said this feels so good i can't i'm sorry i'm not disrespecting you but i'm going and so she come up beside me and uh, she says, I've been doing this since the mid-90s. And she said, no one's ever fallen. Don't you dare fall in front of that nurse's station. <laughs> and I said, I won't. <laughs> and I didn't. And I walked down the hall and back and then went back to bed. And again, there was a day that I knew I was going to get better. You know, there was, there was hope again that I could walk. Um, but that took, oh, it was a grueling. I was down in the rehab wing within, I think it was nine days which is very quick for them because at first you go up to the stroke unit, which is uh, in four Northwest, and they just take such good care of you. And then the rehab unit, if, if you qualify for their criteria, there's 24 beds. I, had, I didn't sleep for the first four days, and in the first nine I had 12 hours sleep. Like, you just can't sleep. And just to backtrack a little bit, when they first brought me to Frank in that ward with the three 90-year-old guys, I, I didn't dare go to sleep because I thought <laughs> they're just waiting for yeah. me to die, right, and wheel me out in the middle of the night. <laughs> so it just, you know, the paranoia creeps in and stuff. Yeah. And uh, But, yeah, 12 hours sleep in nine days, and then they shipped me down to rehab, and they had just found me a room where I could sleep because I, after four days of not sleeping, I went to the head of the night nurse, and I said, listen, I haven't pushed the buzzer. I haven't asked. I said, but I really need some sleep, so you've either got to find me. Well, I'll crawl out on that lobby couch out there. Um, you got to find me somewhere to sleep or I'm checking myself out and there goes your research. You know, I, like I was using anything to, to advantage my, you know, advantage my case. And then they finally found me a room and then I get shipped down to rehab into another ward situation with a, an industrial blower blowing in my ear. So, you know, no more sleep again. So I'm fit to be tied and pretty crabby. And I said, uh, you got to let me go home for the weekend and get some sleep, and I'll start again Monday. And I and I was pretty rude about it. It's probably the one day I, I was not pleasant to be near. And uh, and they listened. And after that, I came back Monday a little bit refreshed and knew there was hope. And it began. And six weeks of every day grueling, you know, work me, work me, sweating, and and it paid off. Yeah. <clears throat> a thought comes to mind. Um, do you get the sense that your body knew how to remember how to move? There is a lot of science now about uh, cellular memory. Yep. And connecting that with you know uh, our neurosystems and synaptics. Yep. So the way you describe it sounds very much like all you had to do is make that connection because your body already knew what it wanted to do. It wanted to walk to the end of that hallway. It, it wanted to wiggle, and and so it might be that everything you'd done to this point in time really helped you, of all things, yeah, um, get through that crisis that you were in because your body knew what it wanted to do. Yeah. So, so muscle memory, cellular memory. Oh, definitely. Memory, all that. That's uh, even throughout the physio when um, they would ask me to do something and I couldn't do it yet. I would say force that leg, like bend it for me. Do it a couple of times, then the brain will remember what it's supposed to do and then I could do one on my own it you know maybe not full but it would start that connection uh, same with music um, the I, I'm a self-taught guitar player so muscle memory is important to me mm. uh, it's one thing that has changed I, I don't I don't retain like I used to like the old stuff is in there but the way I input the new stuff is different and I'm, okay. I'm struggling with that right now but you know it, it's back about 75%, I'd say, and I just have to learn new ways to make my brain work. But you're absolutely right. The muscle memory, or cellular, or whatever you call it, yeah. um, I would tell them all the time, force my limb to do it. Uh, for example, these two fingers here on my right hand didn't work for at all for about the first three weeks, and it bothered me tremendously because, you know, I thought, well, I could hold a pick and, you know, but these, they'll get in the way. Yeah. And I'm like, is there anything we can do? And and Dr. Obama said, well, you know, that, that, that might be the deficit, you know, that might be the line. And I just said, no way. I was sat in my room because I wasn't sleeping anyway. <clears throat> I sat up all night with my hand held over and just willing it. 
And thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Patreon.